you know how you have one of those mornings and you're like trying to figure out why is everything going wrong and why is this happening to me and <laughs> so you have like a rough morning but you know what God's good and everything's going to be okay and we're going to uh, have a great morning and worship him this morning so you guys just stand up and let's get to worship
fact that God in the flesh came to this planet and took all of my sin, everyone's sin, to that cross. And, and Father, we just—it's hard to wrap our minds around, you know, that. We're just so thankful for we're on, we're on this side of the cross, and, and that was what Your plan is, and, and we thank You for it. Uh, just be with us now, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We have a communion in the front, the back of the church, and welcome to the one who is back to the season for next 
to Gandhi's quotation. And the note read, reality check, he's in hell. Well, Bell saw that and was struck. Bell would go on to write a book titled Love Wins. And the book is basically an argument that there is no hell. You know, there are a lot of people today that think that way. They believe there's heaven. They don't necessarily believe there's hell. They'll say God is love. You can't send someone to a place like that. He's too merciful. He's too kind. He's too forgiving. Last series, we looked at the Word of God to look at the reality of heaven. This morning, we we're going to use the Word of God to look at the fact and reality that there is hell. So let's notice first this morning that hell is eternal. Hell is eternal. Last week we noticed, or we looked at how awesome heaven will be someday because it will never decay, it will never spoil, it will never fade. This week we noticed that hell will be eternal decay. Everything. And all good will fade. One day Jesus tells the story about people not following their king. They are selfish and they allow others to suffer without making any effort to help them. When Jesus describes them as vile, selfish people, let's pick up the story. It's found in Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 40. Jesus taught, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now, it really doesn't get much clearer than that, does it? I mean, right here in this one little story, Jesus describes heaven, eternal life, and hell, eternal punishment. Now, you need to know, again, Jesus is the king in this story. And those he puts on his left will go to eternal punishment. No second chance, no hope for a day when the punishment will end. I saw a clip some time ago where a judge read a sentence of punishment to a criminal in courtroom. It included several life sentences. They didn't run together. They, they, they were like put on the end of each one. And by doing it that way, the judge said, I'm making sure you never get out of prison. And the criminal yelled up to the judge, you may as well just kill me now. No hope. That's how hell will be. No hope. People just longing to be dead. Notice Revelation 14, beginning with verse 9. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, no day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Now here we notice some things about about this eternal punishment. Those there are burned continuously with burning sulfur. 
I don't know if you've ever been burned. I imagine all of us have been burned, at least a little bit. Nothing quite like the pain of, of a burn. It doesn't go away. For it to go away, it has to begin to heal. Or you have to take pain medicine, sometimes strong pain medicine, to overcome the pain. It just keeps born. It just keeps burning. Well, listen to this. Punished with sulfur. No day or night. <coughs> illuminated by fire. No rest. There won't, those there won't be able to sleep, won't be able to go to sleep, sleep away from pain for a couple of hours. Just continuous, eternal suffering. Notice what was revealed to John concerning how Revelations 21, 6 through 8. He, Jesus, said to me, It is done on the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. <clears throat> to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the coward, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars will be consumed to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, last week we noticed the third heaven, the place God and Jesus are, are preparing for the righteous, the place they dwell. This week we noticed the second death. Now, what is this second death? Well, it's not a physical death, it's a spiritual death. <clears throat> because again, we've read in scriptures that punishment will be eternal in hell. But the first spiritual death is when you sit on earth. When you're born, you sin. And you need to give your life to Jesus Christ and he'll cover that sin. But if you never do that, that's your first death. And then when you die without Christ's blood covering you, well, that's the second spiritual death. The spiritual death you face in hell because you did not believe. Also, did you notice the first two descriptions of those going to hell? I mean, we understand the rest of them. We understand that if you have a pen and you're a murderer or sexually immoral or you're a magician or an adulterer, you're a liar, we understand, yeah, those people never repent, always sin. They're not going to heaven. They're going to go to hell. But did you notice that cowardly will be there? You ever notice that? Well, who are the cowardly? I mean, is it a sin to be a coward? Well, I believe the cowardly are those that did not stand up for God. Those who allow sin to reign and those who accept immoral behavior. <coughs> Just get used to it. Never stand up. Remember a few years ago when Chick-fil-A was being attacked, standing up for some morals, standing up for God. They could have been risking their business. But guess what happened? Business increased. Instead of one time all the way around the building, they were parked two times around the world. Being closed on Sundays. It's blessed that company, most will say. <laughs> well, there's going to be a price to pay for those who have led people towards immorality or just allowed them to live in their sin, even supported their sin. For those who have taken, out of, taken God out of our schools, out of our government, out of our society, the vote for those who have not stood up? The coward. Did you also notice that passage says that those who not, do not believe in God will be eternally punished? I want to tell you, if you do not believe in God today, ask God to help you with your unbelief. Pray that prayer nonstop. Because when He returns, or if you die, only those who believe in Him will be in His presence. Well, let's notice next. Tell us eternal, but hell will also be a place on fire. Place on fire. Fire can be a beautiful thing. Even amazing. I was driving home from a basketball game this past year. I don't remember exactly when it was, but I passed a house way out in the country, and they had a fire going, and it was the largest fire I'd ever seen. I mean, it was massive. I, I don't believe it could be legal. 
Uh, it was that big. The flames were three or four stories in the air. It, it was huge. It made the person standing near it just look small. It was amazing to look at. Some of you like to go camping and sit around the campfire at night with the fire thing and talk and that sort of thing. Because it can be soothing, it can be warm and amazing. Well, if it's burning you or destroying something you love, there's hardly anything worse than a fire. Fires of hell will be destructive. I don't care how much you like fire. You will not like fire if you find yourself in hell one day. Notice Revelation 20.10, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into a lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophets had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Lakes of fire. You know, I like to wear shorts. Most of you know that. Back during COVID, I even wore shorts up here while I was being filmed because you couldn't see my legs. And, uh, I wear them all the time to go home. That's the first thing I do is put on shorts. It's winter, spring, summer. And this winter hasn't been too bad. So I've worn them. A lot of days out to go shopping or out somewhere. You know, the public seems to not like that. They <laughs> seem to not like someone wearing shorts in the winter, especially older ladies. All right? You know, I'll, I'll walk by them and they'll look at me and look at my shorts and smirk their face and shake their heads. And I know they want to say, What are you wearing, young man? You know, but they should be like me. I mean, I look at their three coats and four scarves and hats and gloves and it's 56 degrees outside and I'm going to say, what are you wearing, you know? I just don't like hot. I don't like it. I would rather be cold. Well, hell's going to be hot day after day after day after day. It's going to be hot. I told someone last week was thinking about turning the boiler up this morning to about 90 degrees to where it was hot in here. You know, about halfway through the sermon just say, you think it's hot in here. You wait until uh, you mess up and don't go to heaven and see how hot that is. It's going to be a place of unrelenting heat and fire. Notice next, hell will be a, a place where the worm never dies. Most scholars believe the worm described here is a maggot. Uh, the maggot is such a disgusting name and, and worm, is it not? Why? Because it shows up when things rot. A couple of years ago, I prepared seven pounds of sloppy joe meat for an event that we were having. And the event got canceled, so I put it in a fridge with the freezer down there in the basement of the parsonage. I put it in the freezer down there. Well, I just forgot about it. Didn't even think about it. We had a couple of events. Probably could have used it about it. And then when I did see it, remember, we didn't have any events planned. And then I noticed, I, I Googled it, it had gone bad. It had been in there too long. It had expired. Uh, so I couldn't even take it somewhere where someone could, could use it. Now I have to get rid of it. So I decided I would wait till Tuesday night and put it in a couple of trash bags and put it in the dumpster. I wouldn't do it earlier because their dumpster gets it gets picked up on Wednesday. And I thought that way it probably won't get to smelling too bad and, and be too bad. But it was summer. Uh, and the next day I went to throw a bag of trash in the dumpster and, and it had been dumped. However, there were thousands of maggots in the bottom uh, of that dumpster. I guess they got to the meat before uh, it, it actually got dumped. And it was disgusting, you know. Now here's the scary, thing, the creepy thing. The next day, they were gone. Gone. Where'd they go? You know, I'm starting to look around the house and went, where, where did they go? You know, just, they're disgusting. We don't want them in our home. We don't want them on us. They're disgusting. Mark 9, 48 49. And if your eye causes you to stumble, stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them uh, do not die and the fire is not quenched. 
Everyone will be salted with fire. So what are the worms? Those maggots eating it now? The rotting flesh of those being punished for eternity. You know, that right there should be motivation to seek to be saved by Jesus Christ. Hell will be a place where the worm never dies. Let's notice next. Hell will be a place where thirst is never quenched. Are you beginning to notice what hell will be like? I mean, an experience full of things we do not like, full of the sufferings of this world and beyond. Have you ever been really thirsty where your lips are chapped and there's little to no saliva in your mouth and, and you just feel exhausted? How did that first taste of cold water feel? It was amazing, wasn't it? There was relief, instant relief. Let's notice a story in the Word of God about hell. It's found in Luke chapter 16. Let's notice verses 19 through 24 as we begin to look at the story. It says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died. The angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Because I'm in agony in this fire. Now, if you were purple in biblical days, you were extremely rich. My friend Rick passed away a year or so ago. He liked to figure things out, not just hear something, but actually figure it out. I would have called him a couple weeks ago if he was still alive and asked him uh, about heaven because he actually studied that, that city of heaven we looked at last week, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles high, 600 stories. And he actually figured out how many rooms could be put in, in that building. And it was billions of rooms. But he also figured out one day that Bill Gates could go to the bank, fill a pickup truck, bed, the bed of a pickup truck full of money, and drive it home. But before he got the money home, the interest on his remaining money would cover the cost of him taking that money now, I don't know how he figured it out. I don't know how it's true. He's much smarter than me. But here's the thing. I know Bill Gates is rich. He is a rich man. And he could probably afford to give some leftovers to someone in need. And from what I hear, he does get a lot of his money away. But this rich man, he wouldn't give anything. Even the scraps that fell off his table, he wouldn't give to this beggar. It wouldn't have hurt him at all. It wouldn't have hurt him no matter how much he would have given. Now remember what we looked at earlier. Jesus said, he's that beggar. Jesus said, whatever you do for that beggar, you do for me. And whatever you do not do for that beggar, you do not do for me. And because the rich man refused and had a hard heart and died, he went to eternal punishment, just like Jesus warned us. And notice his, fur, his thirst. Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Because I'm an agony. He's so thirsty, he asks if that beggar, who he probably stuck his nose up against for, for some time, if that beggar could just dip his finger in water and give him one touch to his tongue. Hell's going to make the arrogant beg. Beggars without hope. Just one drop of water. Please, thank you. Just one drop. Let's notice the, the next part of that story. Verses 25 through 28. Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here. And you're in that. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm that's been, been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, 
nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, the rich man answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Being in hell, knowing that your loved ones might be coming there, I think will be one of the hardest things to accept. Because when they get there, they're not going to meet you or help you or be around you. The Bible speaks of the loneliness of hell. They're not going to be a comfort to you. They're just going to be scared in the darks and the fire and be tormented. And to know that you didn't reach out and tell them about God and to know they have nothing to do with God and they're going to be coming to that place, it's going to be something that never leaves our hearts going to be pain, deep pain on the inside. And did you notice the rich man is still begging from rich and arrogant to tormenting, to being tormented day and night, burning fire. Begging to keep his loved ones from coming there. Begging for just a drop of water. Hell will be a place where the thirst is never quenched where the hope is never restored. Let's notice next, hell will be a place where there is gnashing of teeth. You've probably heard that. I looked up what that means, a gnashing of teeth this week. It means grinding one's teeth together, having one's teeth set on edge, or biting down in pain, anguish, or anger. You know that feeling. When something you want to work doesn't work, you keep trying because you know it's got to work, but it won't work. Then you get worked up. You start grinding your teeth. And you start maybe shaking your head. And maybe say some things you probably shouldn't say. Uh, you, you just want it to work. Well, that's going to be the spirit of everyone in hell. They're going to be so frustrated and so much pain. They're going to know they could have gone to heaven. They're in hell. They're just going to grind their teeth and curse because they're cursed. Luke 13, 27. But Jesus will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evil doers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God but you yourselves we're thrown out. In misery, those in hell will see into heaven and weep and gnash their teeth because they messed up. They let themselves, others that they love, end up in eternal punishment. Well, let's finish up with the final reality of hell. It's been a very encouraging sermon today. I've seen a lot of smiles. But here's the worst reality about hell. And that is God will not be there. He will not be there. No hope of the goodness of God because He will not be there. God's presence will have nothing to do with it. God and sin cannot exist together. Hell will be full of sin and sinners no God. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8 He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. That will be the worst part of hell. Or of hell the best part of hell. You know, God's in this room this morning. He says, well, two or more gathers. He's there. God's in our heart. For a Christian this morning, He chooses to dwell there. But those in hell will be shut out from His presence. He won't be in their hearts. He won't be in their existence. Now here's the good news this morning so that we can leave encouraged. It's not too late to inherit heaven, that, that inheritance from Jesus that we looked at last week. You know, I mentioned last week, heaven is mentioned 276 times in the Bible. The word hell, only 54. 
Bible has a lot more to say about heaven than it does hell. And I do not believe that to be an accident. You see, Jesus wants us in heaven. And that's why he came as a servant, died on the cross, and resurrected from the grave. Because he wants everyone in heaven. So if you have not given your life to Jesus, you're all to Jesus. As we looked at last week, he's standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. He has no desire to let you go to heaven. He wants you to open the door to heaven. He wants that to build, that to be your home. In fact, right now, he's building a place for you. There's no reason to experience the reality of hell. Get this. There is a real heaven. And there is a real hell. And that will not change. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God says it. Heaven's not going away. Hell's not going away. What will be your reality? Let's stand and pray this Dear Lord, we just thank you for the great and awesome God that you are, for the way you help us in so many ways, and for the fact that you save us. May we live in that salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
Um, please notice your prayer list today. Quite a few people there that really need prayer. Uh, Paul's brother passed away this week, so please keep Paul and that family in your prayers. Um, I haven't heard that Mike Cannon has passed away. Has anyone heard that? Uh, he is doing well, uh, for sure, but I don't have a way to call him. Um, and the nursing home don't give you much information. But I gave him my card and my number, and I'm hoping they'll call. I was there a couple of days ago. He was talk, trying to talk a little bit, but they said it wasn't going to be much longer. So keep Ed, uh, or not Ed, Mike, in, in your prayers. Mike Cannon. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the God that you are, for the way that you comfort and heal us and save us. And Lord, we, may we never take that for granted. Lord, we do lift up the activities of this church and things that we have planned, especially the Easter activities. Uh, may you help us do them in a way that, that just shows your love, glory, and grace to everyone that attends. Lord, we do pray for Mike can be with him and allow him to come into your hands in a, in a peaceful way. Uh, just be with that family and wrap your arms around them and, and keep them peaceful and strong as well. We pray for the others on our prayer list for Paul's brother and that family dealing with that death and others that have experienced deaths in their families recently. And just the disease and the suffering that's found there. We know, Lord, that uh, the best part of all of it is that we have hope in you and that there is a heaven. And someday we won't experience those type of things. But until then, may your, you be their strength. May you lead and guide us. Thank you again for the God they are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>